but I'm delighted that we can start this, this day uh, with a Make It Clear seminar. That is, that we're making it clear what we know to be true in our hearts and, uh, and, and how the Lord Jesus Christ has made an impact in our lives for all of eternity. And the idea here is that we're, we, again, we want to make it clear. We want to understand and know. And as I've been sharing with you before about my own uh, journey, uh, I'm delighted that I can hear uh, some, some tools, uh, some, some uh, ways that we can share, uh, and, and even uh, making it clear in our own lives uh, just what Christ has done for us and how, and how, we, uh, and, and how we should process all that. So uh, thank you all. And uh, Dean, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Before we start. Yes, I will. And then... Uh, Okay, go ahead and clap. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, um, let's go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, pray. Father, we're so grateful for this day uh, that you have certainly commanded us to make disciples, uh, but through our own objections, sometimes uh, the message gets clouded, and we don't, uh, we don't uh, share the gospel. We don't disciple because we just don't know how, maybe. Uh, or maybe we have other types of objections. So, Lord, I pray that right now we would leave those at the door, uh, that we would have open hearts and open minds to uh, receiving some, uh, some uh, practical lessons, uh, practical tips, uh, but also, Lord, some, some grounded, uh, all this being grounded in truth. So, Father, I pray that as, our open, uh, as we open our minds and hearts to, uh, to the discussions today and the seminar today, I just pray that you would be with us, Lord. Uh, let it resonate in our hearts, the truth of the scriptures, that we might be motivated by the, by the power of your Holy Spirit by the, uh, through the reading and understanding of the word of God. So, Lord, thank you for this time. We ask that you would guide us and direct us this day. Thank you that Dean is here with us. And as we go, I pray that we would make it clear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, I want to start by thanking you for being here. A five-hour piece of time, chunk of time out of your week is a big investment and sacrifice, especially to Americans who tend to be so very busy and you have your own lives to live and things going on. It really tells me a lot about your heart. Um, you know, there are two things that we can do here on earth that we cannot do in heaven. One of them is to sin, and the other is to evangelize. And it goes without saying which one we should focus on. But the fact that you're here tells me a lot about your heart. Um, you know, Jesus found evangelism to be a focal point in his life, of course. Uh, we read about him leading others to Christ throughout the New Testament. Uh, the end of all the Gospels end with a challenge of a great commission to take the Gospel to the ends of the earth. The very um, last words he said when he was here on earth in Acts 1.8, he talks about how we are to be witnesses in our own Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. And the fact that you're here tells me a lot about your heart. Because if that was important to Jesus Christ, if that was a core aspect of his life, uh, it speaks well of you. So thank you for being here. Of course, Matthew 4, 19, one of my favorite verses, um, Jesus said, he said, come after me and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we want to talk about that today. And in my sermon tomorrow, I'll have uh, some additional material on lessons on fishing. So I hope that you can come back for that tomorrow. Um, I'm going to have to shorten this up a little bit and make them about 30, 35 minute sessions uh, due to the restriction of time. So bear with me if I uh, try to get through this. We have two basic goals. Uh, one, we want to prepare your head. Uh, we teach expository evangelism at Crossway International. Uh, but we also want to prepare your heart. Your head and your heart really need to be engaged if you want to be in the game and uh, participate effectively in the area of personal and creative evangelism. So if you turn to uh, your workbook, everybody have a workbook? You should have a prayer letter, 
Uh, you should have a blank, a blank sheet of paper. John will get that to you if you don't have one just yet. Um, and you should have a gift cube, okay? Uh, but if you turn in your workbook to page one, uh, I'm not going to read the uh, table of contents. I'll let you read that through yourself just to save time. Uh, now, if you have a cell phone, let me go ahead and ask you to put it on mute. The only phone call we will accept is one from Jesus today. So if your phone rings, it had better be Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Session one, prayer and evangelism. How do those two relate? One, prayer to the true God is unique to the Christian faith. Uh, you have Muslims, they pray five times a year, but they don't pray to the true God. You have the Jews who pray at the Wailing Wall uh, all the time, but they don't know Jesus Christ as, as uh, the Lord. Uh, you have the, some orthodox religions, and they go to position to position to position or station to station to station within a church building praying, and they think that this kind of effort and energy and prayer can help uh, uh, save them. So prayer is not a means of salvation. We are the only ones who have, those who believe in Christ, who have a legitimate right uh, and ability to pray. Uh, it's not always understood, however. I was in Nigeria one time, and a young man asked if I would pray that he could go to Bible college in America. He lives in Nigeria. And I said, well, I don't know if that's God's will or not. I will pray that, you know, if it's the Lord's will, that he'll make clear to you which Bible college to go to. And he says, no, 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 it's got to be in America. And I says, well, <laughs> how do you know? I mean, sometimes it's hard to know how to pray. So the safest thing to pray is to pray the text of the Bible. Uh, we should learn to pray as the Bible instructs us to pray and to follow examples. Um, okay, it's especially true of, that there's confusion in how to pray for evangelism. There's seven basic texts in the New Testament that deal with prayer and evangelism, and in English, the key word, or I guess idea, memory device, is blocks, B-L-O-C-S-S-S. -S -S. That might help you to remember them. Uh, for the first one is we are to pray for boldness. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I might fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may speak it boldly or fearlessly as I should. Uh, Jeremiah 20, verse 9, you might jot that down, where Jeremiah talks about how his word is burning in my heart. It's shut up in my bones. I can't help but speak it. When we're immersed in the word of God, it will burn in your soul. You'll want to speak his word. You'll want to share the gospel. Uh, Paul was fearless in Acts chapter 14. Uh, he had just healed a crippled man in Lystra, and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to him, and he's rejected it, says you can't do that. And then in uh, Acts chapter 14, verses 19 and 20, it says, Then some of the Jews came from Antioch and Lyconium, they won the crown over, and they stoned Paul. They dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. That's boldness, a fearlessness to take the gospel anywhere. I went to a church in Florida one time, and I, I shared how I've been to a lot of kind of dangerous places, Pakistan, China, um, Sudan, places like that, and I've never been hurt. Nobody has ever laid a hand on me. Now, I've had urine thrown on me, I've been cussed at, I've been threatened, but I've never physically been hurt, and I, I told him I, I feel a little bit guilty, because when I read the life of Paul, he was whipped, he was stoned, he, I mean, he had all kinds of physical things done to him. 
At the end of my message, the pastor got up and he called the deacons forward and they came forward. And then he said, I want you to take Dean outside and beat him up real good so he won't feel so guilty. <laughs> well, they didn't do it, but it, he made his point. Uh, <clears throat> We need to have a certain amount of boldness or fearlessness. There was a lady one time in uh, New Zealand who called their 911 number, and they couldn't understand what she was saying, and they kind of got the idea she must have been gagged and taken hostage, and they found out her address from her phone number. They rushed there, and they found out when they went in the house the reason why she couldn't speak on the phone. She had accidentally put uh, super glue on her lips, thinking it was lotion. So all she could do was, was mumble. And sometimes I think we're like that. Uh, we're fearful of sharing the Word of God with our friends. We become so tactful that we never get around to it. I went to a uh, slavery museum in Badagri, Nigeria one time. I put the chains around my neck and the chains on my hands, and it was just a uh, a fearful experience to feel chained like an animal. And on the way out, I was going blind at that time, and I felt a metal plate on the table about this size, the size of a three by five card, and in the middle there was a slot cut out. And I asked the museum director what that was, and he says, would you like to try that one on? I said, try it on, what do you mean? He said, well, they would, what they would do with the lips of the slaves they would put that plate over their mouth, pull their lips through, drill holes, and put a lock on their lips to keep them from talking to one another and conspiring against their masters. And sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes fear just overcomes me, mostly on a one-on-one -on -one situation, not so much in a group. I feel like there's a good chance somebody here might respond to the gospel. But there's always that nagging fear on a one-on-one -on -one what if they reject it? What if they reject me? Uh, in a crowd, there's always usually a few that might. Uh, so I always feel somewhat hopeful. But on a one-on-one -on -one basis, it's either all or none. Either they kind of move in that direction or they reject it completely. So there's always a certain amount of fear. It's a very normal thing. Also, Acts 4, 29 and 31, you might write that down where they, I think it was Peter who prayed for boldness, and in 31, God answered his prayer. So we need to be praying for boldness. Now, some say, well, I'm just going to live for Christ. And that's like building a bridge that goes nowhere. When was the last time somebody came up to you and said, you know, your life is so different from everybody else's. Uh, can you tell me why? Uh, that doesn't happen very often to me. It's happened a few times but I've probably counted you know, on one hand how many times that has happened. Uh, we need to combine a, a testimony living for Christ with a testimony of actually using words and sharing the gospel. When good people are silent, only evil will be heard. And sometimes we're a little more silent than we should be. Um, okay, let me skip through some stuff. It's true that one option is to not speak. And then we can just love people right into hell. You can be the most loving, kind person, but you may not be helping at all in terms of, of showing people the way to heaven. It's like two wings on an airplane. You really have to live for Christ on the one hand and then speak for Christ on the other. So I want to encourage you to pray for boldness. Uh, fear is a very normal thing, but don't make the mistake that some people make. They go around and they share with how fearful they are or how maybe they had an opportunity to share the gospel, but they were afraid to do it. They tell their pastor, they tell people in their Bible study, they tell everybody except the one person who can really help them, and that's God. So learn to pray for boldness. Okay. Okay. Now, you need to remember that it is a process. Uh, we've all met people who've been rude. That's one extreme, to just, you know, no preparation, uh, no what I call chumming the waters before you throw the hook in. I'll talk about that tomorrow. 
Uh, and we've seen people like that, and we have a tendency to go to the other extreme and be far too tactful. We need to learn to ask questions to lead people into the truth. So learn to overcome fear with boldness by praying and asking God to help you and to help those around you to be more fearless in sharing the gospel. Number two, we need to pray for uh, laborers. Luke chapter 10, verse two, he told them, uh, the harvest is great, but the workers or laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest, therefore, that he might send forth workers into his uh, harvest field. Uh, I was teaching this seminar in Latvia one time, and um, I, I shared a story of Robert Woodruff. Now, he was a president of an American corporation back during World War II, and he decided he would make his product available to the military uh, men and women around the world. I don't know if you've ever traveled out of the country. Some of you may have been in the military. And you know what it is to have American food. And sometimes when I go, when I, well, at that time, when I went to Russia, I'd have fish for breakfast, fish for lunch, fish for dinner. I was really tired of fish. Um, uh, on the last day, there was, they had opened a McDonald's at Moscow. So we went to a McDonald's and I got a hamburger. Uh, McDonald's is my favorite Scottish restaurant. And <laughs> even overseas, after three days of fish, you know, for a week or two, McDonald's hamburger tasted great. And so Robert Woodruff wanted to kind of encourage the troop and make his product available at the same price that you pay for here in America. So he got the heads of his various departments together. He says, I don't care what it costs, let's get it over there, let's ship it over there. So they shipped it over there. And I was sharing this illustration with uh, some people in Latvia. My interpreter, Tsintar was his name. He interrupted me and he said, you know, I was drafted into the Soviet Union military. And I remember going to a very remote outpost in Siberia in the military. And when I got off the plane, there they were selling that product. You know what that product was? It was Coca-Cola. <laughs> they have like uh, 800, 900,000 employees for Coca-Cola. And the whole purpose is to make uh, Coca-Cola known, this brown, fizzy sugar water. Well, how much more should we be praying that God would raise up believers, uh, you know, people like us, to be workers and laborers in his harvest? And uh, in fact, we're a lot of, some of the countries I go to, I've been to more than 50 countries, uh, many of them that I've been to, like in Kenya, Ethiopia, well, not Ethiopia, Liberia, the English is, is widely spoken, especially among the educated people. So there are opportunities for, you don't have to necessarily learn another language. It's good to do that, but you don't necessarily have to do that to be a laborer in his field. And the same thing is true here in the Maryland. Everybody here pretty much, I think, speaks <laughs> English, maybe fewer and fewer, I'm not real sure. But um, we need to be praying that God will raise up laborers for the mission field. You have to be careful, though, because the lips that pray that prayer may be the very lips that God wants to use. So when you pray that prayer, be careful, because he wants your lips, not just your head and your heart, but he wants your lips as well. Number three. Uh, pray for opportunity or for an open door. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, pray for us too that God may open uh, a door for our message, basically the gospel, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Uh, a person with a message needs an opportunity to share that message. I'm convinced I have far more opportunities to share the gospel because I actually pray for opportunities. Before I left on the plane uh, yesterday, I prayed for opportunities to share the gospel. And I got a chance to do that in kind of a, uh, um, a quiet way by passing out my business card, which has my testimony and my story on it and a picture of one of our orphans from Sudan. It creates a little bit of intrigue. People wanna know why is an old blind man traveling 
and they find out that I've been to more than 50 countries and they're interested. So try to figure out a hook, a way to gather in and bring people into the harvest. Pray for opportunities to share the gospel. Um, I was, <coughs> excuse me, I was taking a team to uh, Ukraine one time and I was going through the seminar uh, session by session with the group that planned to go with me. And one of the, the members of the team was an elder in the church. And he came up to me afterward and he said, Dean, you know, I have to confess, in the last two years, I haven't shared the gospel with anyone. I just haven't had an opportunity. And I asked Roger, I said, Roger, have you been praying for opportunities? And he kind of, you know, shrugged his shoulders, says, well, not really. And I said, well, Roger, I'm going to pray before we meet again in two weeks that you have that opportunity. We came back together two weeks later. He was bubbling over. He says, Dean, you're not going to believe what happened. We got a phone call from out of the blue from this couple that we knew 10 years ago. They came by to visit, and I shared one of your gospel tracks with them. It was such a great meeting. And I reminded Roger, I said, Roger, do you remember what I told you I would pray about? And he kind of hung his head, and he said, yeah. You need to be praying for opportunities. I was in Belgium one time preparing a message to teach on Colossians chapter 4 with this verse in it. <clears throat> and it's, it takes a lot more effort to preach a sermon in a foreign language. It takes twice as long. And so I'm working away on this sermon and suddenly I hear a knock at the back door. And it was Nico. He was painting the outside of our house and he wanted a glass of water. So I said, well, come on in. Glasses are up there. Help yourself. And then I, I headed back to my study, and he stopped me, and he said, uh, wait a minute, Dean, aren't you one of those uh, priest kind of people? And I, it's very Catholic over there, and I says, well, they call me a missionary. He said, well, I have a favor to ask. And I said, well, what's that, Nico? I didn't really want to talk to him because I had work to do. I had to preach this message. And he says, well, my daughters have to memorize a prayer at school. They teach a one-hour religion course in all of their public schools. He said, I wondered if you had a prayer that my daughters could memorize for their class. And I said, Nico, we don't memorize prayers. We talk to God as a person. We have a personal relationship with God. We don't memorize prayers to talk to God. And he says, oh, okay. <clears throat> I walked off, went back to my study, hit that verse on Colossians 4, 3, and then I go, ah. There was my opportunity. And I went back in and apologized to Nico for being a bit short with him. And I said, I think I do have a prayer that your daughters could memorize. A real simple one, a four-step plan of salvation. And uh, he was very thankful, came back that night with his daughter, uh, two daughters and his wife, and we went over the gospel again. And that's unbelievable. The people in Western Europe are so hardened against the gospel. Uh, it's a very unusual situation. So pray for opportunities to share the gospel. Uh, I've got more stories, but I'm going to have to skip through them. Uh, okay. Summary. Pray for opportunities. Pray for people that you come across, that you meet, that you can befriend. You don't have to go right into the gospel. Chum the waters first. Love on people. And then as the, the conversation or relationship develops, work the gospel into it through asking questions, through a very uh, low level uh, of intimidation. People are very intimidated sometimes, so be very gentle and careful. Pray for the opportunities to share the gospel. Number four, pray for clarity. Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 4 Pray that I may speak it or proclaim it clearly as I should. Uh, Mark Twain said that the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. You really need to choose your words carefully. Uh, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't know it well enough yourself. That Albert Einstein said that. And Dave Ramsey said it this way. Um, to be unclear is to be unkind. If you're not clear in giving directions how to get somewhere, 
and somebody gets even more lost, that's the most unkind thing you can do. The same thing is true when it comes to the plan of salvation and, uh, and the gospel. <clears throat> I remember one time I was uh, in Kenya and my field director had set up the coffee machine and I, I always pour the coffee over a sink because I'm blind. So I picked up the coffee cup, went over to the sink and started pouring the coffee and it's going all over my hand, this hot coffee. And I'm wondering, what in the world? So I kind of lined it up again, tried it again, and again, it started coming all over my hand. And the reason was, is I had the mug upside down and didn't realize it. Um, And sometimes we unintentionally are not clear when it comes to sharing the gospel. Uh, We'll tell people, well, you gotta commit your life to God to be saved. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you have to go to church every Sunday? You have to work? Uh, There's a lot of different ways to interpret the word commit your life to Christ, and we'll go over some of those things. But sometimes, inadvertently and not on purpose, we're not really clearly uh, preaching the gospel of grace. Um, People are incurably addicted to some kind of works for salvation. And so if you don't contrast it strongly and make it really clear, if you say anything that can vaguely resemble some kind of works or effort on their part to be saved, that's what they'll think because that's all they've ever heard. There's no free lunch, basically. Okay, let's, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if the trumpet should not sound a clear sound, how will anyone get ready for battle? We need to make a very clear sound, a trumpet sound, when we share the gospel. So be clear when it comes to sharing the gospel, and a a large portion of this seminar will deal with that. Okay. Number five, pray for the spreading of the gospel in two ways. Uh, That's your next page on your workbook, it should be. <clears throat> it's in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it is with you. And two ways that we need to pray that it would spread, that it would spread rapidly or swiftly, and that it would be honored just as it is with you. Uh, a, let's talk about swiftly. Um, I remember seeing, or not seeing, but hearing a commercial, I had somebody explain it to me, and it was a snail riding on the back of a turtle. And uh, do you know what a snail says when it's riding on the back of a turtle? It says, "Wee! look how fast I'm going. <laughs> and sometimes I get the feeling that the church thinks that it's really moving fast, and it's really not. Uh, and that's why I'm so excited to see so many of you are here. So is anybody still out there? <laughs> to hear that so many came to the, the seminar, it really speaks well of your church and of yourself personally. We need to be praying that the Lord would spread the gospel swiftly. Um, you can uh, pray for the uh, production of our gift cubes. We'll be going over that later. Uh, the purchase of Bibles, evangelistic materials, any way that we can to get the gospel out. And I'll share a couple of ways that you might be able to do it even in your own neighborhood here in a little while. Um, I remember I uh, brought 25 of our gift cubes over to Liberia and our field director, Isaac, he trained 25 people in his hometown how to use the gift cube. It only took you know, 15 minutes. It's a very simple little tool. They went out, and in fact, it was on an Easter weekend, two Easter's ago. Uh, 25 people went out. They came back on Monday to report in, and they had led over 780 people to Christ. So we need to pray that we can get the evangelistic tools in the hands of the right people, and that the gospel might spread swiftly. And we need to pray that it would be honored. Um, You know, there's a a Coke sign, or there was, I don't know if it's still there or not, a big electronic Coke sign at uh, Times Square in New York. It has 90 kilometers of, uh, or that's 60 miles of fiber optic wiring. 
It's high as a six-story building, has 15, let's see, 15 meters. What's that? Uh, yeah, 45 feet about, something like that, maybe 50 feet wide. It weighed 55 tons, had 18,000 light bulbs, individual little light bulbs in it, and six computers, so the straw would kind of bob up and down inside this bottle of Coke. It had one master computer to run the other six. And it's all for the honor and the proclamation of brown, fuzzy sugar water. You know, how much more should the gospel of Jesus Christ be honored? How much more should we be motivated to take the gospel? I went to the Coke Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. I was going blind at that time. I could still see a little bit. And I remember being ushered into this one room. It was, it was a hot day, so it was air conditioned. The doors opened automatically. And then we sat down in what looked like church pews with these real nice cushions and everybody's kind of scrunched in there. And suddenly the doors closed and the lights dimmed and the music came on. Dum, dum, da, dum, da, dum, dum. I'm not going to sing it for you, but it, and it was a it was a, a the warmest experience. It, it, was, it reminded me almost of a worship service. I kept waiting for the deacons to come forward and take up an offering, but <coughs> they had such honor for that brown. I'm not against Coca-Cola, but I don't recommend you drink it. It's full of sugar and stuff like that. But how much more should the gospel of Jesus Christ be honored. Now, number six, uh, pray for, is that Jesus on the phone? <laughs> it had better be Jesus. Okay. Six, pray for safety of the messenger. Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse two, and pray that we may delivered from wicked and evil men for not everyone has faith. Uh, the gospel is opposed by a lot of people, uh, politicians, uh, religious leaders, especially overseas, even more so, uh, you know, in Canada and places like that, that don't want you to proclaim that homosexuality is a sin. They'll shut down your radio program if you do. Uh, it's under attack, the, the preaching of the Bible and the preaching of the gospel. And then you add on top of that uh, terrorist. And the fact that you're an American, if you travel overseas, uh, there's a lot of unsafe places to go. We, when I go to Nicaragua with the team this summer, we'll have a, a police officer with us at all time just to make sure you know, we're, we're safe. We become targets uh, as gringos in some of these countries and some of the other countries I've been to. I've uh, been yelled at and cussed at in Pakistan in the park. I've been threatened on an airplane. Uh, by a Muslim before we even took off. He wanted to beat me up simply because I quoted John 14, 6. Um, I've had, you know, like I said, urine thrown on me. Never been hurt physically, but there's a lot of opposition. And a lot of times it's from religious people. Uh, they try to shut you down because they don't want you coming into their turf. They see it as their turf. Okay, summary. Pray for safety of the messenger. Number seven, pray for salvation of the lost. Uh, Romans 10, verse 1. Uh, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. That was Paul's prayer. Pray for the salvation of the lost. Also, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 addresses that issue. Uh, <clears throat> it's biblical and proper to pray for the salvation of the lost. Um, I had a friend of mine in Belgium named Willie, and he told me uh, when I taught this material, he says, that's ridiculous. God's uh, uh, omni omnipotent. He's going to save who he's going to save. Man has no choice in the matter. And so to pray for the salvation of the lost is ridiculous. And I asked Willie, I said, Willie, how long have you been a Christian? He said, 20 years. I said, how many people have you seen God use you to bring someone to saving faith? He said, well, nobody. I said, well, maybe you need to start praying for the lost. It's a good thing and a right thing and a biblical thing to pray for the salvation of the lost. Now, two concluding remarks on this uh, session. 
First, for the head. I want you to think about this. Put your thinking cap on. Where is the emphasis of these seven areas that we're to pray for that deal with evangelism? Is it believers or unbelievers? unbelievers. Think about it. Who is supposed to be bold? The believer. Okay. What kind of laborers do we want? Believers. What kind of, who should be praying for opportunities? The believers. Who should be clear? Believers. Uh, who should be spreading the gospel swiftly? The believers. Uh, for whose safety do we need to pray? Believers. And then lastly, pray for the lost. You see, you need to be praying for yourself, for your spouse, for your friends that are gathered here together, that you might come together and make a net and start folding people into the flock. Uh, we need to pray for each other much more than we do. The emphasis from the head perspective is to pray for each other. Revival starts right here with you. It doesn't start out there somewhere. It starts right here with you. Now, secondly, let's talk about the heart. Uh, what type of prayer should we pray in terms of its intensity? Uh, we really need to have a heart of great passion. Uh, you remember that Elijah in uh, 2 Kings chapter 9, uh, it was actually his disciple, Elisha, asked a particular request of him, a certain prayer. He wanted a double portion of what? His spirit. Now that word is ruach in the Hebrew, and most uh, scholars agree that in that context, it's talking about passion. He wants twice the passion that Elijah had. And of course, Elijah said, <clears throat> uh, if you see me go to heaven, go up into heaven, you'll know that your prayer has been answered, okay? Now, traditionally, I, uh, Elijah, during his lifetime, performed eight miracles in the Bible. Now, Elisha saw Elijah go up into heaven in the chariot of fire, the fiery chariot. So if God fulfilled that prayer, how many miracles did Elisha perform during his lifetime? You would think it was 16, but it was really just 15. And you're saying, what? The, the Lord didn't fulfill his promise? Well, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 13, <clears throat> this is what happened. The Israelites went out to fight against the Moabites. An uh, Israeli soldier was killed, and they threw his body into a grave where Elisha had been buried. And when that body hit the bones of Elisha, boom, number 16, he was resurrected from the dead. So even after Elisha was dead, God fulfilled his word. And you know, that's my prayer and my hope, that even after I'm dead and gone, that some of you might you know, learn maybe one thing from this seminar and that it would be used after I'm dead and gone. The same with my kids and my grandkids, that after I'm dead and gone, uh, God might be able to use me in some way uh, to help proclaim and lead others to Christ. Um, there's an old Greek proverb that says this, I'm seeking to plant trees whose sh who sh who shade I will never sit under. Uh, and so it is that I'm planting trees now. I may not be around to see some of you use some of the, the instruction that I'm giving you. I'm 60, almost 67. Uh, I'm almost as old as uh, Joe Krippner, getting close there. <laughs> Joe and I, are, we're getting on up there, and we're probably going to be in heaven before a lot of you. But I pray that uh, his life and my life might leave you something in return uh, that in some way might be used uh, to bring people to Christ. We need to have a passion and intensity of our prayer. Um, okay, let's do a quick review, and then we'll take maybe a short... What time is it now? It's a quarter after. Quarter after. Okay, well, I'm still going a little bit long, even though I'm cutting things out. Uh, what was the first thing we're to pray for? Second? Third? Fourth? Fifth? Sixth? And the seventh? So next time somebody asks you to pray, 
you've got seven things to remember to pray for. Pray the text. You know, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, uh, he made seven statements, the seven, last seven words of Christ. Five of them came or references to the book of Psalms. I think three of them came from Psalm 22, which is known as the death psalm. They say before you memorize Psalm 23, you really need to memorize Psalm 22. I think that when Jesus was hanging on the cross and dying, he was thinking in his head and reviewing in his mind the word of God. He was praying the text. That's the greatest thing I think we can do. Doesn't mean you can't, you can't pray outside the text. Certainly we can. But you really need to focus on praying the text, especially as it relates to evangelism. Uh, let me say a quick prayer right now. We'll take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll hit session two. Father, thank you for those who've come today. We pray that this has been instructive and practical. We do indeed pray for boldness, that you'd give each of us a greater fearlessness when it comes to sharing the gospel, that you would raise us up to be laborers in your field, that you would give us opportunities, Father, to share the message, and that as we do that, we would be very clear using concise biblical wording that conveys the free gift of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And as we do that, we pray that it might spread swiftly and that it would be honored just as it is among us. We pray for safety as we travel, especially those missionaries on the field and those who travel overseas to less hospitable countries. And above all, Lord, we pray for the salvation of the lost, that you would prepare hearts as we go to receive the seed of your word and the gospel. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.